Hi guys, Peter Finch here and welcome down to Finch Friday, your weekly golf Q&A. So first question about Danny Willett, and there's quite a lot of questions about Danny Willett as well. What it was like to spend a day with him, see what it was like just experiencing how he sees the game, how he plays the game, and what the differences are between mine and Rick's games, and also what amateurs do on the course also. A question here on Orlando, and if we're going to this year's PGA show, what the difference is between practicing on golf mats at a driving range and actually getting out onto the course? And also a question about reaching your limits and what your potential is within golf. So a question here from Campbell Jones underscore on Instagram. Hey, Peter Finch Golf, did you see any differences between the way Danny Willett and his caddy went about planning out shots on the golf course and the way you and your caddy normally would go through a shot? Me and my caddy, I don't have a caddy. And also a few tips on the processes that they went through on the course. So for everyone who hasn't seen the videos, Rick managed to get into the Pro-Am with Danny Willett. I went around, carried his bag. Unfortunately, I couldn't play because I just hurt my wrist a little bit, didn't want to risk it. Um, and we went around a full 18 holes with him, filmed quite a lot of it. The videos are coming out as we speak. But the difference between playing with Danny Willett and how he approached the shots and the way that me and Rick would have approached the shots and the way amateurs would have approached those shots as well, it was very different. I think it really came into stark contrast when he was in the wedge distances. So anything from 130 yards in. The amount of detail that him and his caddy went into were just unbelievable. So I think it was the third hole. They were faced with 118 yards and they were talking about not only the distance, but also how far they wanted to pitch it, how many yards of spin they wanted to get on it, how many yards of cut spin in this case they wanted to put on it. And it was just so precise. It was... It was fantastic. But not only that, especially with the wedges, he actually was able to perform what he was talking through. So to say he wanted to hit it 120 yards with three yards of cut, and then to get a little bit of backspin over two yards, and to then actually produce that shot to within, I think it was eight feet that he hit the shot. I think he was maybe a couple of feet short than where he wanted to land it. A couple of yards short where he wanted to land it was brilliant it was fantastic to see so to go through a pre-shot routine in that much detail to really nail down into the minutiae of the yardages where you want to pitch it yardage how much you want to spin it yardage how much you want to cut it yardage you do first of all need to put in the hours and hours and in Danny's case the years and years of practice into the wedge game to enable yourself to have that amount of control there's no point spending that time over a wedge shot if you do not know exactly how far it's going to land and if you have that control. The other big standout from watching Danny was just how he approached his putting and how he read greens. It was so, so detailed. I mean, he was slightly different in the fact that the greens over in Abu Dhabi had quite a lot of grain on. So they were affecting how the putts were rolling across the green. And that comes with experience. You know, me and Rick, we're not used to playing on that grainy greens, but when he was explaining how the different shades and what they actually accounted for as far as break were concerned, we started to get a sense of how you would be able to do that. But again, he was able to take that little bit more time over the putts because he knew his stroke would produce the direction that he wanted to. And it was amazing to see him point out all these different breaks and nine times out of 10, it would happen. And he always had, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure throughout that 18 holes that there was maybe three or four putts that didn't hit the hole. The rest either went in, hit the edge, lipped out or just grazed the edge. He was so accurate and again it's one of those big differences he went around in i think it was four or five under not playing fantastic golf just in a few good shots you know fantastic chipping on 14 and just getting some putts that were just brilliant and his wedge play i will keep going back to his wedge play because it was brilliant he was never outside uh, a putt which he could make with his wedges he was always giving himself a chance and it's such a stark contrast to my game, to Rick's game, and to pretty much everyone else's game as well. This question from Christian Pleasure. Do you guys fly to Orlando for this year's PJ show? So yes, me and Rick have booked it. We're going to the merchandise show in Orlando. We've been for the last three years now, and it's incredible. The best way to describe it is I used to live in Shrewsbury, which is capital town of Shropshire. It's only a a, a medium-sized market town, but the city centre is enclosed within some old, well, the footprint of some old medieval walls. And I reckon that the PGA Merchandise Show, which takes place in Orlando in the Orange County Convention Centre, is probably the size of that town centre. So you basically go into this massive room, and it's a small town of golf. And for me and for Rick, when we've been the last few years, it's just been amazing because we just, 
we walk through a town of everything to do with golf. New equipment that we've never seen before, launches that we're anticipating, technology that is beyond what we could have expected, some really weird items as well. It's just a fantastic place to be. And certainly from a video perspective, the last few years have been amazing for actually meeting up with people, for meeting new people as well, to try and get some interesting content out there. Because in that place, pretty much everyone from the golf community is there. And as mine and Rick's, our subscribers grow, our viewers grow, and the amount of coverage that we have, which again is thanks to you guys. Thank you so much for supporting the channels. I honestly cannot overemphasize how much it means when you do subscribe because the people who are in the business are now coming to me and Rick and saying, well, how about we give this a go? What about these types of videos? What about this project? You know, do you want to do something a little bit outlandish and crazy? So not only are we coming up with ideas ourselves, but people from the golf industry are coming to us and saying, you know, what about this? What about that? It's, it really does inspire us when we're out there to see all these new ideas and to really engage with other people within the industry because at the end of the day, it's going to give you guys more content. It's going to allow us to do new things. So we can't wait. Question here from Rob Pittaway on Twitter. Peter Finch Golf. Hi Pete, well, how would you split your time between driving range and course in a month for those who can't play as regularly? This is a tough one and it's something which I will always try and stress with all my students. I'm going to change camera angles, it's getting bright. This is something I always go through with my clients because this time of year in the UK and other parts of the world, because it's wet, because it's a bit grim out on the golf course, a lot of people do become very range orientated and range based because to get that golf fix and to work on your game and practice, the range is sometimes the only place to go. I would always say be careful, be very, very careful about that because when you do go on the range, you can get very, very good at practicing. And going out to the course off real grass, you know, off lies that aren't perfect all the time, sometimes adjusting a new technique which you may be working on on the range and actually putting that out onto the course can be difficult. It's certainly something which I did when I was 15, I think it was a 15, 16, maybe 16. And I wanted to really, really get better that year. And I think I started the year off five. I should probably remember this if I'm gonna launch into a story about it. But anyway, around I was 16, I was off about five, and I really wanted to get better. So I worked on my game, I had lessons, and I really, really smashed the range practice. And technically, I got so much better. The only problem was, I wasn't playing. I was practicing on the range, I was practicing on the range, I was putting on the green, I was chipping, I was doing all this hard work, but really only playing maybe once a week, and then in competition. And the problem was I was so good at practicing off the range. When I got onto the course, it's a very different environment. You know, you've got different winds, you've got different lies, and I wasn't able to adjust. And at the end of that year, despite being technically a better player, my handicap actually went up, I think by one. It wasn't too dramatic, but it went up when I was really wanting to drive it down. And the following year, I just made sure that I was playing a hell of a lot more, and it helped. It really did help because the technique that I'd worked on, that was still standing up, but I was now playing under a little bit more pressure situation. I was actually out on the course and playing golf how it's meant to be played on a golf course. So although it might be a bit difficult, yes, by all means, practice on a range. But if you spend two hours practicing on a range, please spend another two hours on a golf course. Try and split your time evenly if you can. And I know it's difficult, it is difficult, it's easy for me to say, but please try and work that into any practice routine that you're having. So a question here from Gordon O'Reardon, who comments quite a lot, thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, Pete, do you think you can reach a limit while playing golf? Getting lessons in handicaps, sticking probably like a lot of others. Uh, help us out, any tips from what you can do, cheers. Golf is a sport that there is really no limit to how good you can get as far as handicap is concerned until you reach the age where you just cannot produce the distance and the power that you need to shoot low scores. I honestly do believe that if you're focusing on the right things, if you're getting good coaching, you can really achieve whatever you want to achieve as long as you've got time. Because time is, at this moment in time, I would say for most people, the biggest handicap, quite literally, to getting better at golf. So many people who come in for lessons, you know, we talk about improving, we talk about getting better. And often it's the case that I have to be realistic with people about their expectations because they want to get, say, from 20 down to 10, but they only have time to practice or play once a week. Now that's because people are busier. You know, there's no doubt that 
within the last decade, people's lives, people work, it just seems to have grown and there's less leisure time. And at the end of the day, if you've got only three or four hours a week to spare, like a lot of people have, you would rather spend that on the golf course and on the range, getting out there and playing. And if you're doing that and you're expecting to improve week upon week, it's just not gonna happen because golf is a sport that you need to dedicate time to practice to. So it's not always easy. However, if you get that time, if you make time in your diary to practice and to play, I don't believe in limitations. I really, really don't. I think people have an amazing capacity to improve if they work on the right things and they work in a smart way. That's always been my belief and I still stand by it. But like I said, you've got to understand what your time limits are, your time constraints. You've got to be realistic with your goals. And if you are reaching the age where you can't hit your driver, you know, past 90 yards, then, you know, maybe that 59 on a 7-2 course is out of reach. Maybe. Right guys, thank you so, so much for watching. As ever, thank you for getting involved. Please comment below. I'd like to know what you think. Like the video, share it around, and follow me on my other social media platforms. I will see you down here next time.